All right, so um, for you guys that don't know me, my name is uh, Daniel Cook, and uh, I grew up in construction. My dad is a, uh, is a contractor specializing in uh, concrete, and my family's been doing been concrete finishers for about the last four generations, so all the way through the, my uh, great-grandpa. And one thing that I found out growing up was people don't understand much about aggregates. Engineers go all the time, they specify um, a gradation or you know this, that, or the other about aggregates, but they don't really truly understand what, even what they're specifying sometimes. And um, you call up rock quarries, and they may or may not, you know, they may have their own little special blend, and that may or may not be good for your application. And uh, so I came to OSU and I started doing a lot of research looking at um, concrete and how aggregates affected it. And so, you know, looking at proportioning it mainly. And so um, through a series of conversations with contractors all over uh, the country, I came to the conclusion many people truly don't understand aggregates. It's not that they don't, um, they're not smart people, it's that they've just never been exposed to a lot of, um, they never had an aggregate class. I mean, not that that's exactly exciting, but they've just never had one. And so today what, um, we set up these lectures to kind of help give some knowledge into specifications. I came up with uh, notes for about an 18 week course, but uh, we I kind of, combined and shortened a lot of the uh, lectures I came up with into uh, about 30 pages. Hopefully I can get it done within the next two lectures. And what it's really going to uh, kind of dance around is different uh, specifications, different properties that people talk about in the industry as a whole. So you can kind of get a little bit more of a, you know, a little bit more background on what you're talking about. And so that's... Um, Kind of what this is really all about. So, just to get started, um, when you walk away with this course, you pretty much learn a little bit about aggregate properties, the chemical makeup, um, gradation, and um, specifications. So, So, as an engineer or a contractor, why do we need to understand materials? I mean, in general, can we just specify? Just doesn't anything work? Well, what you got to understand is how the material of a structure is made, constructed, and function in an environment all affect the performance of the structure throughout its service life. So that's a huge concept. Very, very important to understand that. And um, it's also even more important to specify, especially for a certain area, um, the, you know, the requirements. And so um, aggregates, it's just a general term for crushed stone, sand, and gravel. I mean, that's the basics. But why are aggregates really important? Well, they're used in quite a few different construction applications. I mean, anything from concrete, asphalt, CMU units, clay brick, um, aggregate base for pavements, drainage behind uh, retaining walls, and even like filtering your water. You know, water treatment plants use them. I mean, a lot of different places use them. So just on average, it takes about 400 tons of aggregates to make a house. For a four-lane highway, it takes almost 40,000 tons of aggregates. And then, um, you know, for a 100,000 square foot office building, it takes about 5,000 tons of aggregates, which, I mean, this is quite a bit. So if we really look at this pie chart down here, and this is, you know, millions of metric tons, I mean, this is cement, this is steel, this is your asphalt. Everything else is aggregates. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a, a large component. Like, I, like it said in uh, 
over here. I mean, it, concrete, it makes up about 60 to 80% of your overall mixture. And then asphalt's composed of almost 95%. So, I mean, I mean, it's important to understand what you're looking at. And so most iron specifications are uh, performance-based. You know, the end result, that's what they really care about. And so um, the availability, the application, the cost, the durability, and the serviceability, those all really play into um, the specification. And probably the biggest one is, is how available is your aggregate. Um, you know, obviously all over the country, there's different places have different sources. In some places you can't find um, river sand or, you know, natural sand. And you have to use more of manufactured or ship it in from a different state. And so that's a really important topic to um, kind of understand. And most, most of the time, whenever you're actually talking about um, specifications, mainly state DOTs and big private sector businesses, they're the ones that actually typically specify um, aggregate specifications or just most construction specifications in general. They're the ones that kind of play the key, the key role in that. And so um, the most common specification is gradation. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that than many of my other subjects. And, uh, you know, typically people have it are either minimum or maximum value for a specification. And then tolerances for a precise value such as gradation is very common. So what am I really getting to with specifications? What am I trying to kind of glean from this? Well, this is, um, this is kind of the rock that we use um, for, for our lab stuff, which is um, one of the big quarries in the state of Oklahoma. And, you know, you have limestone right up here. And, uh, you know, what's limestone? Then you have different absorptions of your coarse aggregate. You have, um, you know, freeze thaw durability. You have all these different, you know, specific gravity, all these different um, test descriptions. Then you have your test numbers of what the what the test was that actually evaluated, um, you know, your test description. And you know, to me, whenever I first looked at a lot of this stuff, I said, I don't, I don't really understand even what these tests are. So um, I'm gonna try to gleam a little bit about understanding more about this chart here. So. Let's talk first about a little bit about the chemical makeup. So there's really, if you go back to geology class when you're in the fifth grade, you really talk probably, you know, you talked about three different classifications for just probably aggregate. You had metamorphic, igneous, and sedimentary. There's just kind of your basics. And uh, metamorphic, it's created from pre-existing rocks using temperature and pressure. And this is where uh, marble comes from, slate. And then igneous, it's, it's formed from hardened magma. And this is usually a crystalline structure. And um, things such as like granite are, are, uh, are the igneous ones. And then you have sedimentary, which form you know, from physical or chemical uh, degradation of your, of your rocks. So this is where limestone and dolomite, sandstone and shell and even chert, this is kind of where they're kind of classified at. And so, you know, most gravels and sands are usually sedimentary. And then um, most construction aggregates are really, you know, crushed stone, river gravel, um, river sand, um, manufactured sand, lightweight aggregate. These are your, your t typical aggregates people sell. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about each of these um, each of these subjects. So crushed stone is just rock that is uh, crushed to meet a industry specification. So typically, um, typically limestone and dolomite they make up almost 70 percent used in the United States for um, aggregates. And then 
And then uh, and then granite makes up almost 14 percent. And then you have some sandstones and, and such. And so your stone type, you know, like like I said kind of before, your limestone's a sedimentary, and that's actually more of what I'd call like a common chemical composition, common name. That's kind of what I'd actually would actually uh, describe it as. And so uh, you also have dolomite, which is actually calcium magnesium carbonate. So the magnesium, if you're used to like a, a normal crushed limestone, magnesium actually gives a dolomite more of a uh, white look. So it looks more something like this, where it's not exactly gray. You know, some are even some are even more white than than uh, than gray. So that's kind of just kind of basics of dolomite. And so some people like to you know it's not necessarily a limestone. It's not necessarily dolomite. So they'll call it like a dolomitic limestone. And uh, I'm not a petrographer, but um, there's some good stuff out there with petrography. And so um, granite's really made up of quartz and uh, feldspar. And then quartzite is uh, mainly made up of quartz, go figure. And sandstone's kind of quartzite, feldspar, and opal all kind of mixed in. And manufactured sand, what that actually is, is these crushed, um, these crushed uh, stones that we just talked about. Uh, after the whole entire coring process, you have these big piles of just like fine particles that you can't really, you know, pass the number four. And so um, there, are, there are many different manufactured type sands that people either wash and sell or just sell as screenage, which, you know, they don't wash it or crush it or anything. And so uh, there's, there's a big boom that people are trying to use a lot of the, of the you know, manufactured sand right now and whatever they can. And then you also have lightweight aggregate, which is a manufactured sand. Typically, it's from shell and slate um, type. And what they actually do is this is very similar to the cement production, what they do there. And uh, well, they put it in a kiln, and they rotate it. And then they actually, um, after it gets out of the kiln and hardens into kind of clinker balls, what they'll actually do is they'll actually crush it to a certain gradation. And um, that's also, I have a section um, on a big class handout notes that I'm going to post to OptimizeGraded.com. And you guys can look at it, and it'll actually have more information if you wanted to look at it. And so you also have uh, natural sands or, or and, and uh, crush, crush river gravel. And so these are usually fine at somewhere, in, you know, typically in water, and they're composed mainly of silica. And um, river gravel is mainly used, um, can be used in decorative concrete. People don't typically like to use it a lot in asphalt, but they will if that's what they have. And then um, natural sand is mo used, I mean, people love natural sands. So it's used in, in many different applications. So just kind of the basics of material properties in general. Um, physical properties of a, of a material is a characteristics that can be physically measured. A chemical property of a material is a characteristic created through a chemical process. And so a mechanical property is one where you actually put, um, is actually uh, when you put a load on um, a material, actually seeing the physical properties, um, how it changes them. And then a durability property is a characteristic of a physical, chemical, or mechanical property that is uh, being affected by the environment. So these are just some very basic 101 materials type um, terms uh, for explaining, you know, just, just any type of material whether it's wood or concrete or asphalt or, or, or aggregate. Um, you know, they all have absorption and specific gravity and abrasion. And they all have all these different properties that you can actually measure and test. And so, um, and that's kind of some of the basics that we'll kind of go over. So, 
specific gravity is a is a it's really it's a ratio comparison of the weight of a material to the weight of concrete in a volume. And so um, there's three different specific gravities, and uh, and you can and the equations are right here, and you can actually go through and and run um, for coarse aggregate or for fine aggregate. You can actually run the ASTM and ASHTO. So typically, if um, if you don't if you're not familiar with testing, so ASHTO is um, for more of pavements and, and and bridges and stuff like that, or more state jobs. And then ASHTO or uh, ASTM, that's more for what I, what I would call everybody else. You know, these are these are what I have seen. What most people call a specification is if um, ASHTO. Usually, they look at ASTM, ASTM, and they wait a few years and they see how well it's actually performing in the field. Then they may make it their own specification. But anyways, um, so the SSD is typically used in concrete to design for batch weights because you want to know the surface saturated dry condition of it. And so, um, you know, that's what most concrete guys, that's what they kind of focus on. Asphalt uses bulk dry to convert uh, to dry weights um, for a uh, volume. And then apparent specific gravity is actually used a lot to uh, for stone blocks and stuff like that to actually get the unit weight. And so if you ever ran specific gravity and absorption, you may, you may look at your numbers and you're like, so are these things right or not? What, what's going on? And so it's really important to um, have a good grasp and a good feel about what you're actually looking at. And so limestone, all over the world, it varies a lot. Sometimes it is the best rock that, that you know, period. I mean, it's great rock and for that area. And then other places, it is the worst, poorest rock. You know, it's, it's bad to use for many, many, many different reasons that we're going to talk about. Many different properties are just horrible. And so um, through specific gravities, I mean, they range quite quite large. And typically when people call things like a limestone, sometimes what they're actually saying is a dolomite also or dolomitic limestone. And so um, I've noticed in many different um, good books, they will actually use limestone and dolomite when they actually kind of mean the same thing. And so um, granite. That's typically your typical numbers for specific gravity as you go down. So um, after you run these um, these tests up here, you kind of want to know, you know, are, are my numbers, do I need to rerun them? You know, I checked with the quarry, they looked okay. And, you know, this is another good check to kind of look at. And so with lightweight aggregates, these, I mean, again, these are manufactured aggregates and so this is you kind of want a really lightweight aggregate or a really lightweight specific gravity so um, now let's look at uh, particle angularity so people get angularity and texture and shape confused many 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 times and so what I'm actually talking about is the jaggedness of the aggregate so um, Kerbin, who is a really, really amazing geologist, he did a lot of, a lot of good things. He really did. Um, he came up with this really cool scale, and um, and other people have as uh, used comp computer animated imagery to come up with their own numbers, but they correlate to this. Um, the Kerbin scale. And so if you look at this scale, what you're actually doing is, is, you know, the edges of this, if you really look around, I blow it up. So this is, you know, well, there's, there's no jaggedness whatsoever. And as you start, you know, moving in the scale, you start getting a little bit more jagged and a little bit more jagged. And eventually, we'll come to you know where it's really, really, really um, angular. 
So I'm not the I'm not an artist, but um, you know if we assume these are all kind of the same shape and and everything, um, but you can kind of tell that you know this is this is kind of how people measure angularity. And so another guy, Tucker, he actually came up with a cool little scale where this is down here, where this is very angular, and then this is you know more like it's round. And so that's just kind of what, what angularity is really all about. So let's talk a little bit about crushed faces. This is a topic a lot of people don't understand. And so um, whenever I wrote this up, I accidentally wrote the wrong number. This is actually supposed to have three crushed faces. So in your notes, you may want to change that. Um, that's my fault. but. Um, but anyways, what crushed faces are really all about is it's a it's a way to explain angularity in a way uh, visually without using without using a without using this guy's this guy's scale because you know I mean it's just kind of a, an eye with that scale and in the past we haven't had the the you know the imagery type um, computer technology so. We haven't been able to really use it, and so people in the past they have used um, a crushed face. And so what I'm actually talking about, as you can see here, this is a very round. Think of like a river rock, where it's very very round, and then you put it through a crusher, and then you can see that it, the faces of it. So if I talk about this rock here. There's faces of it, and you can actually say this face here got crushed, this face here got crushed, and this face here. And one may even call this face crushed. So you may say there's four crushed faces. I probably only call it three. Um, the ASTMs are not as, believe it or not, they're not um, ASTM or the Ashto. They're not as like great at explaining. Um, you know, they even have visual stuff, but there's a lot to still be um, contributed to this uh, to this standard, and so what you do is you can do it, you can do it a few different ways. You can actually say, okay, well, um, oh, let's do an example down here. So typically, when people um, when people go and actually specify um, crush faces, they'll say, I want my you know my crushed face percentage to be, let's say, 30 percent. At least have two or more crushed faces. So, so what percentage has at least? Yep. Have at least two or more crushed. Faces, and so what people will actually do is they'll actually count this, and they'll say, okay, they'll they'll, they'll get their gradation, they'll put it out, and they'll sieve it, and then they'll actually um, they'll actually count. And they'll say, okay, this is one, two, three. So okay, that's, so that's more than two, and they'll put it in a pile. And anything that has um, less than that, they'll put in another pile, and then they'll actually um, typically. They're actually either numbered by the particles. You can either measure it by the particle number or by mass. And so they actually will use this equation where you have your percentage, so the amount of fractured particles divided by the total amount of particles times 100. I mean, that's pretty, pretty basic one-on-one algebra. So if we did the same thing and we came out with, well, let's say um, there are 20 particles and we had 40 particles in general, times 100, you know, you'd have 50% that would have um, two or more crushed faces. And so, um, and that's just real basic, but um, it's really important for crushed faces, especially in the um, asphalt industry, because unlike concrete, they, um, they don't always, um, if they use like, say, like a river rock where it's crushed. 
So river rocks, you know, supposed to be smooth like this up here. We'll actually put river rock through a crusher so that um, it has, you know, it'll have faces. So this one has two faces to it. And so what they're trying to do is have that aggregate interlock. And that's a huge deal whenever, you know, for um, the durability of your uh, asphalt structure. Huge deal. And so now let's talk about um, particle texture. So this is actually talking about the surface roughness. Not the angularity, but the surface roughness of your particle. And um, asphalt is really big um, into um, texture, especially for surface wear. Um, obviously, if you have, I mean, your aggregate's pretty much exposed in asphalt. So if you're driving a car over it all the time, eventually the texture of your rock is actually going to start getting smoothed over. And so it actually won't have um, as good skid resistance in your car, which is can be very dangerous, especially when it's uh, wet outside. And so what people have came up with is, I think this is actually by Ames came up with this, but and you may not be able to see it exactly great, but um, this is supposed to be very smooth. And then as you keep going, it gets more and more and more rough on the surface. And so um, another thing I should probably point out for concrete, people have said that low texture can create um, poor bond between the um, aggregate and the paste. And so you may have lower strengths. People have said that. And they've also said things about workability, too. But um, another, another important thing that people uh, talk about a lot is particle shape. So this really describes your dimensions and overall shape of your particle. So um, this, this has a lot of different impacts. And um, people always think of a, you know, a nice round rock or, you know, or, you know, angular rock, something like this. They'll think about this. And really, I mean, rocks come in all sorts of sizes. I mean, this is from the exact same, uh, I think they're different sieve sizes. I think these three right here, these are all the same sieve size that, that are retained on the same sieve size. And, you know, this is kind of what people think of. This is kind of what people want. But you can have it where it's very flat, very elongated, or you can have it where it's just very flat and not so elongated. And so um, what I'm talking about is um, these different ratios here, the different equations. And so this chart down here, what it's actually explaining is, is um, where it's very cubical. So what, what people may call, may call this cubical. And then, you know, where this might here might actually be flat, this rock right here. And this is where it's maybe more just very, very um, elongated. And so what people have came up with is by using these different ratios up here, they've actually came up with different um, with different um, equations, and they came up with this test for, and hopefully people, if they've taken a materials class, they have ran this test where this is actually um, ASHTO, and also, or it's actually an ASTM procedure where you actually can measure um, different ratios. So, in general, people will actually specify a, a certain ratio for, um, for an aggregate pile. And so what I'm saying is, is they'll actually use these ratios here for flatness or elongation, or flat and elongated. Um, and they'll actually use these ratios, um, which you can actually go and change your caliper um, for two, you know, two to one, or three to one, or five to one. So, you know, this is two to one, and uh, you know, and it's the same thing for elongation or flatness. And so, most people, um, a typical specification for flat and elongated would be something like um, oh, a three to one. Um, well, it'd probably be more like 
thirty percent or less on um, thirty percent or less um, of a ratio three to one. And so kind of like what I was saying, where you know instead of a two to one, it'd be a three to one here. And it's you know it's very basic. All the stuff I've just talked about, all this is just very basic stuff. I mean, things that people have came up with all this stuff for the last hundred years, really. I mean, it's pretty close to a hundred years people have been building, and um, a lot of this stuff is very manual. Um, you know, just kind of, kind of. Everybody's you're measuring this by hand, and um, here in the last probably ten years, people have really quantified a lot of these, um, you know, whether it's shape or texture or angularity, um, into using computer programs and trying to ex trying to explain, you know, about a certain quarry. And and there's still quite a bit more to to learn from a lot of that. You also have abrasion. So when people, when you hear aggregates and abrasion, most people will think of this cute little test down here, this Los Angeles um, degradation test. And so what abrasion really is, is it's, it's your resistance to wear. So the, the ability of the aggregate surface to resist polishing due to, you know, rubbing such as like traffic or um, particle collision. So, you know, if you're, say, like concrete or asphalt, you know, if you're mixing up uh, the aggregate and they start breaking up on you, that is not good. Or if you're going and taking a load of aggregate and you're moving it from one place to another and as it's, you know, as you load it and then you unload it, you know, it's, it breaks up because the aggregates are colliding together. That's not good. You know, how does that one perform? And so um, people have... Um, have done many different tests. Um, they've came up with a lot of different stuff, whether you're talking about railroad or, or, or whatever. But this is the, the most common test that people um, typically run. And so these are just kind of the basic steps where you actually you wash, oven dry, and sieve the aggregate into um, sizes. And then using the specified gradation limits, you actually blend the aggregates together. And then you put it in this um, cool little bend here with a bunch of steel balls. And then you rotate uh, the machine for about 500 revolutions. And then you sieve all the aggregate um, over the number 12 sieve size. And anything that is less than that is um, you know is, that's kind of that's the where the particles collided and broke up. So you know you have your, your original mass that you weighed, and then after um, you sieved it, and that's kind of your loss value. You know over a hundred percent. That's kind of your loss value. And so th there's there's typically there's not really necessarily a range. Most DOTs will specify somewhere between twenty five to fifty five percent. And then um, typically the maximum is usually around 40 if you, if you really want to have a number. But obviously the higher the, the percentage loss, the, uh, the more um, it's acceptable to abrasion. So, and, um, so here's some typical rock, you know, rock type values. You know, limestones and dolomites, they're pretty much just, you know, they're very similar. And then... Um, you know, as you go down, you can see that sandstones, you know, which is to be expected if you ever dealt with sandstones. A lot of times, you know, they're not um, very abrasion resistant. So, and then there's also other other abrasion tests. I'm not exactly going to go into every detail, but uh, the micro Deville has been another test that um, many um, DOTs have started to spec, and it's very similar to um, the LA abrasion test, and you can look it up. Um, ASTM or the ASHTO. And then um, for railroads, they'll actually use the mill abrasion test um, to actually look at it. Railroads have a lot of specifications. They do a lot of um, they do a lot of stuff 
they have they like to have their own little their own little specifications, which I can't blame them. And so um, they'll also some people also take this thing they'll call it an abrasion number, which used in a lot in, in railroad design. And they'll actually run the LA abrasion test, and they'll actually run the um, mill abrasion test, and they'll combine it together in this equation and come up with an abrasion number. And um, I don't necessarily think that any of these Abrasion tests are great techniques for looking at the performance of um, in the field, but you know these are these indicate stuff. It's kind of like for concrete slump cone; they'll indicate something, but they may not be. That's not a perfect. They're not perfect test. So, um, kind of a, a basic summary table. Um, you can find. There's a lot of good summary tables, a lot of good information in the uh, aggregate handbook. I, didn't, I forgot to mention this at the very first. And this is actually um, published by the National uh, Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association. These are, this is a really good book. If you're a student, it's $35. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's very cheap for, you know, for, for a book. And it gives you pretty much everything you want to know. So if you can't go to sleep at night and you, you know, you're real bored, this is a good book, especially to read. So, um, and then, so just to get back to basic summary table, um, there's different properties and then our different um, quarries that are different um, course types that you can actually get. And so it's really good whenever you know you either run a test or. If you get, um, if you go to a different place and you're a contractor and you actually get the um, the aggregate, um, you know, gradation sheet and property sheet, and you can actually go and sometimes we'll have, you know, some of these things like specific gravity and and uh, especially gradation, and you can actually an absorption. You can actually look to see kind of where your stuff is compared to other things. And um, a lot of the mechanical properties and stuff like that we're not going to talk about. It's in my uh, big, long uh, lecture notes if you um, are more interested. And that's uh, mechanical properties is a big research item right now that um, people are lacking, especially. And so it's really interesting, some of the stuff I've been reading the last few years about it, because people are really starting to get into uh, mechanical properties. So let's we'll talk a little bit about chemical properties. Um, one thing that it's important to realize whenever you talk about aggregates and water. So some aggregates are actually hydrophilic, where they're attracted to water, and some are hyd or, uh, hydrophobic, where they're actually they don't like water; they repel water. And so most most aggregates that actually repel water are your carbonate aggregates. Uh, they tend to be more hydrophobic, and, um, and typically um, aggregates like this are actually uh, more acidic by nature. And so your hydrophilic um, is more of river gravel, and and typically um, asphalt, since it's really exposed to water uh, when it rains, they they um, they don't really necessarily like using um, gravel because of this. They'll have um, some problems, some some streaking problems, and um, there's another thing that your, your solubility, so the tendency of a material to be dissolved in a liquid, which is not good if you know if you if you're using um, behind a retaining wall and you have a bunch of rocks and then you know water goes through them and then they all you know they all get dissolved in the water. I mean that's 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 not good, and so it's important to um, you know, that's an important property to kind of look at. And then you also have um, chemical um, reactions. So this is where the surface of the aggregate chemically reacts with a substance such as alkalines uh, to sh change the, sh the aggregate structure. And so um, I'm not exactly going to talk about ASR or many other different things, but um, they're they're in the classroom notes if you'd like to, to look into those. And then um, also Dr. Lay goes quite a bit into um, ASR and um, and his uh, durability concrete durability class.
So a little bit about chemical impurities. So chlorides, they can actually corrode rebar that are, you know, and so it's not good to have high concentrations that are just in your aggregate. Sulfates, you can have sulfate attack. Um, you know, that's also bad. Clays really mess up your absorption. So if you have a high amounts of clays, um, you're, especially for concrete, you're really going to not be very happy. And it also affects your bond really bad with asphalt. And so um, chert, which I really dislike this um, chemical impurity because I see a lot of pop-outs uh, with concrete. So, you know, that's obviously not good whenever your surface pops up, especially if you're if you're a uh, if you do a pavement and people people really don't like that. Um, I've had many conversations with guys about that. And then you also have uh, sulfide ions, which um, is kind of you know corrosion with metal, steel, and copper. So. I was going to talk a little bit, um, at least, at least um, say it. So there's another one that um, I wouldn't call it a chemical impurity, but I would say it's another property that's important to look at, and that's soundness. And so what I'm actually saying is, is the the ability of the material. to resist excessive change in volume. And so um, people really like to um, talk about um, soundness and put that as a specification. And a lot of the, the, the soundness tests they use aren't very good at all. And, um, but, it's, but it's really important to know, you know, how bad, you know, if, you're, if your aggregate, if it, if it expands a lot or, you know, shrinks a lot, that's not good. Especially, you know, for concrete, especially, um, it'll, you know, crack your concrete really, really bad. And so... One thing that people have used for a, uh, a soundness test is ASTM C88. And pretty much what you do is you um, Im immerse your, um, a, a gradation sample, a specified gradation, into a solution of uh, sodium or magnesium sulfates. And you see how long it takes you know, through maybe like five different cycles of putting it in there and then putting it in an oven and letting it dry out. And through these cycles of uh, putting your aggregates into the solution and then letting them dry out and going in a circle, um, people specify if, if it can, you know, go through five or more cycles and then they'll conduct like a sieve analysis. And then, you know, they say, okay, is it, you know, is it good or not? And so, um, and they'll look at the gradation. And um, it doesn't necessarily, that test doesn't necessarily correlate very well to the f to field performance. And, you know, that's another area that's um, for chemical, that's just people specify it, but people don't really truly understand it. And so there's still a lot of um, research that needs to go on but a lot of people don't necessarily want to go around doing aggregate research. You know, it's not sexy. It's not like cement. And so um, we talk about durability properties. So again, this is a physical, chemical, or mechanical um, effect um, of a material due to the environment. And so kind of like what I talked about before, so effects of moisture, you can actually have stripping um, in asphalt, where this 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 there's a lot of research about to get published on this, and it's actually um, a thought that um, the surface charge. So whenever it's 
um, hydropho or hydrophilic, um, the actual aggregate wants to bond to the water as opposed to the asphalt cement, which is a huge, I mean, that's, that's not good. So it'll actually, um, if tires go over it, it'll actually strip away the, the asphalt binder, which is, which is really bad. And they actually have an ASTM. Um, you can actually test for this. So for concrete, um, you know, freestyle durability is always, always, you know, a huge issue. Almost every, uh, anything that's, ex any concrete that's exposed to the environment, they always talk about freestyle durability. And, um, and so what that's really all about is when the water, so whenever, when water goes into the pores of, um, of the aggregate and they freeze, or, or concrete, um, it actually builds up pressure, and that this pressure gets, um, whenever it melts, it'll actually um, be released. And as this, you know, as these keep cycling, you know, pressure builds up, pressure goes down, pressure builds up, pressure goes down, um, and it goes through these all these cycles. It'll actually eventually um, break the concrete or break the aggregate, and so it, you know, it's that's not a good thing. Especially when you want like something like concrete to last 50 years or so, and so there's two there's two um, different procedures, ASTM C666. Uh, 666, that's the devil's number, They'll, you know, and so that's 300 cycles. Ashto has the has a very similar procedure, but it's 350 cycles. So anything you do for if you're a researcher and you do stuff for DOTs, um, 350 cycles is actually what they use. And um, for it, for the test, for this um, triple six test, they'll actually um, use, they actually look at concrete. And pretty much what you do is whenever you, after you, after you go through and you go through the normal procedures up here of, um, of making and curing and, and making your beams, you'll actually run a modulus you know, your initial modulus, and then you go through all these series of um, 300 cycles of freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing in this um, metal coffin-like chamber until um, you either reach 300 cycles or 350 until, or until the concrete cracks and breaks, and then you have, you know, until you can't pretty much get a reading. And... Um, what you do is to get the durability factor, you get the measurement, is you actually um, do this uh, initial, you know, initial final different, um, this equation right here to come up with your number. And this durability factor, most people don't exactly, um, they specify different things, but a very common number is 70% or not, or up. Um, and this test is, it's pretty harsh in reality, especially if you don't really have environments that have very many freezing and thawing cycles, or if like, say like concrete, if um, your whole entire life, say like 50 years, they only go through 150 cycles. You know, this is, I mean, this is not even, for that environment, it's not even the same. Um, it's not what it would actually perform like. So that's kind of important to, to realize. And so now let's talk a little bit about um, gradation. So gradation really describes the particle distribution of the um, aggregates. So what I'm actually kind of trying to say is, is if you look here, these are all kind of um, uniformed. They're all pretty much the same size, you know, or some people call them open graded. So they're all mono size. They're all the same size. And then um, some, you'd actually these are like where they're just really like small fines, where they're more like sand. And so, if you look real close, you can actually see um, these circles that were here actually um, 
the artist was actually meant for them saying that they were taken out and they were getting replaced by these little bitty particles. You know, or you can have something like well graded, where you have um, particles of all sorts of different size part diameter particles can all be together. And some people say, no, I don't, you know, maybe gap graded is better, where you have um, where you have um, particles that are that are mainly um, you have a bunch of big stuff and you have a bunch of small stuff diameters and you know you don't necessarily have anything in the middle you don't have kind of like up here you don't really have the, the bigger stuff and so you can also have where you just have no fines whatsoever and, you know these are just kind of some kind of some visual explanations of what's going on and so how do you really explain particle distribution? Well, typically, you run a sieve analysis. So if you ever took a materials class, hopefully you ran, ran one. And for coarse, you can use these two tests. Or for soils, you can use um, the, these tests. And so, um, you know, a, diff, a, a basic sieve analysis It'll actually have different sieve sizes, and they'll all be stacked up from um, the highest, the highest opening, all the way down to the lowest opening. And so these are on this sheet here. These are just different um, sizes that are very common. So um, you know, you have kind of the standard size, and then you have you know where it's in more metric, and this is more what we use in the United States. And um, you actually have the sieve opening, so the nominal sieve opening. And so you can actually get the, the actual diameter. So when somebody tells you um, the number four sieve size, that, that you know the aggregates retained on the number four sieve size, that's actually the the um, opening that they're that they're actually talking about. So all the aggregate retained on that is actually bigger than that the diameter. And so. Whenever you start actually talking about just sieve sizes, and when you run a sieve analysis in general, typically people um, talk about these ranges. So it'll range from where you have inch and a half, six inches, you know, stuff that are more like riprap, or you know, really riprap starts around six inches, and it'll go up. Or you can have stuff like crushed crushed stone, where it's kind of typically say people usually say from one and a half to number four. That's very, very typical. And then, um, you know, crushed stones the same way. And then all other people, they'll talk about um, intermediate. So usually that's from um, half inch to number 16. It's very, very typical. And then they'll have um, a natural sand will actually be from that actually around number four. And it'll usually go to a number 200. There'll be very little retained on the number 200 usually. And then you actually have um, kind of like what I talked about before with manufactured sand screening type stuff. And so these are basic definitions that most people have used in the field. So whenever you talk about after, like I said before, with screenage or manufactured sands, um, this is the byproduct left over by the uh, crushing process for a quarry and so when people say screenage that means when it's it's not washed it's not crushed nothing and people will call this manufactured sand and they may say an unwashed manufactured sand but they're they're really meaning you know stuff like screenage so screens are actually that's um, when you're in a quarry the screens are actually the stuff that actually you know it's like a big sieve so that's, you know, after everything gets done, that's what's still on the screen. So that's why it's usually commonly called screenage. And so uh, you have washed manufactured sands where it's just, it's just washed. You know, the screenage is actually washed, and then they sell that product. And then you have fine manufactured sands where they're actually uh, washed and recrushed into um, to make a, a finer gradation. And so that's kind of what I'm um, trying to 
explain up here. And so, you know, and again, depending on your area, depending on what type of uh, applications you're looking at in your area, depends on what people actually want to use. And so, some people don't have any manufactured sands because they have a lot of, na you know, natural sands. So they don't need to necessarily have a fine, a fine manufactured sand where they recrush it and rewash it. They just have a lot of screens that they use. They have them in piles, and um, they may sell them to, uh, to especially whenever you do a lot of fine grading and um, um, for, for when you do a, when you build building slab, you'll have you'll have to have some fine grading um, to make sure the the ground's level before you put your concrete on there. And you know, same thing with you know pavements or anything else. So there's a lot of there's uses for this. But people are always trying to find more and more inventive ways to do this. And so, let's see now. Um, so, I know whenever I was in school, um, when I was an undergrad, I talk, I, I'd hear people talk about, well, this is well graded, or this is gap graded, or open graded, or uniformly graded. And um, kind of like what I talked about before, showing the visual pictures. This is, these are you know just the basic definitions that I kind of already explained, and people love to classify whether it's a um, individual or a combined gradation where you actually have your rock and your sand combined together. Um, and so, people when you talk about individual sieve sizes, they'll actually describe um, describe the amount retained or passing small, medium, or large. You know, this is just kind of a judgment that's, you, you know, very broad statement. And, um, you know, and a lot of that comes from experience. And then also, you know, people tend to classify gradations into, you know, similar groups. So they may say a coarse aggregate, or they may, you know, then they'll have like a fine aggregate. And, um, you know, you even have an intermediate aggregate in there. That's very common too. And then asphalt, they they'll have like six different you know aggregates into a combined gradation um, to, to to produce their asphalt. And you know a lot of these classifications that people use they're very general, very broad. And a lot of it has to do with what application you want. Obviously, for something like open you know for open graded, uniformly graded, that you know that's good for drainage, you know. Um, but for but if you use, you know, like a well-graded aggregate for drainage, it's not going to work as well. It's not going to flow through the flow through the, the water's not going to flow as well. And so, but if you use open-graded for um, aggregate for, like, say, concrete, you're not going to like that very much. It's it, you know, it won't want to your your mix will segregate. And so, and there's a lot of other things, you know, that are just people just don't like. Um, And so what I'm trying to get at is with these broad statements that I kind of explained is people have came up with different techniques to kind of explain um, gradations in general. So they'll run like a sieve analysis and they always um, graph it. They always graph it either cumulative percent passing, which is very common, or you know percent retained. Or cumulative percent re percent uh, percent retained, and then they'll actually have the individual percent retained, and um, you know these are all very common. I've seen people um, use each of these, you know, even though they're in the same field. They'll, I've seen people use all three of these, and so um, you know it's just a representation of what your gradation is actually doing. And that comes a lot with experience. So understanding the distribution is extremely important. And so um, people have came up with a lot of different ideas, but but when you get down to it, a lot of people just say, well, it's just an art. And so gradation, like I like I said previously, it's either from a single stockpile or it can be whenever you have like a a, a coarse aggregate. Intermediate aggregate, fine aggregate, whatever you can put your rock and your sand together, and you can you know combine them. 
And so people use combined gradations a lot to look at the performance of their, um, of their for their application for asphalt or concrete. So one of the very first methods that people used was actually created by uh, Thompson and Fuller for concrete back in uh, 1907. And what they did was they actually claimed um, that this graphical method they came up with was actually the optimum gradation for concrete. And so, and so, um, and ask what we found out was people still use it. Don't get me wrong, but for many applications, it's too harsh for concrete. And uh, people in asphalt really like it. That, I mean, that's like the bees and ease to them. And so, um, and then another gradation technique is the individual percent retained chart, which um, this this can actually look at high and low points very very easy. And so. This is kind of the cumulative percent retained chart right here. And so whenever I was in undergrad, I, when I first saw this, you know, I kind of grew up in construction. I know a little bit about aggregates, but I kind of, I'm like, really, this is how you present this stuff? You just have a chart, and you know, if you look, none of this stuff, it's all different, you know. And I was like, well, what's going on? And what it is, is um, Fuller and Thompson. They actually came up with, um, they actually found out that if they go and they raise all these sieve sizes to the power 45, so D over little d to the 0.45, so this is your lar largest diameter sieve size divided by the diameter uh, sieve size that you're actually looking at over uh, 0.45, it'll actually make this straight line. And so what people have, um, what, how they came up with this, they found out that if they did this equation, that their course aggregate, a lot of times when you plot it, it'll be very straight. But then it'll push all your fine aggregate that's over here, they'll push it and squeeze it all together. And so, um, but you know they were one of the first people to really come up with a lot of this stuff, so people just ran with it, not even understanding if you know squeezing this together does it even matter. And um, but kind of what I'm trying to get to is with this curve, what people will actually look at is they'll actually say like kind of like what I was talking about: is it um, is it well graded? Is it gap graded? How do you know? And so if you really look at it. Let's say we, I'm just going to draw something. Let's say that from here, instead of this, this combined gradation going like this, let's say it went like this for a little bit. And then all of a sudden it just goes boom, down. Okay? You, you can you know, very clearly tell that, okay, so percent passing, so bam, something passed here, and then you go, well, pretty much nothing did, nothing, and then boom. So you can tell that um, people may maybe say like this area, they would say, okay, well, this is, you know, um, it may be, well, maybe not this area, they might call gap, but they'll say there's nothing there. It's, you know, this flat area equals almost nothing passing. And then they'll say here, well this is really steep, so there's a lot passing here. So, you know, steep equals a lot, in parentheses, passing. So that's kind of that's kind of the basics. And so you can also look at something maybe like this. And so this gradation right here that I just created, people, they would say, okay, well, from here to here, this area, that's real steep. This is real steep. And then from here to, I mean, really, you get to this sieve size, you know, I mean, this is decently flat. So there's a, you know, there's a gap here. It say you know this is this is gap graded, 
And, you know, that's kind of what they look at. And for asphalt, what they'll actually do is they'll actually take control points and they'll say, okay, so your gradation, it has to, it has to start, you know, it has to pass the number, let's see, the 19 millimeter. It'll have to be right here. Your gradation has to be from here to maybe like here. And then they'll say, okay, we'll want another control point. So right here, we'll have one from here to here. Then we'll have another one from here to here. And, the, you know, the, these aren't exact numbers. They'll just be control points where they force you to be within a certain gradation. And, um, and people have added and added and added and, and, and have used this with great progress, especially in asphalt, to, to really explain things. And people have said, when you talk about a maximum density line, this straight line that goes, that goes um, from your origin, um, what that actually is, the people have said it's the maximum density line. So you want your, so for asphalt, they want it to be almost as close as they possibly can to this line. But then they kind of, they, they, they kind of don't exactly get real distinct over here though, talking about, talking over here. They don't, they, you know, it's all squished together and, and, and people just don't really want to talk about it a lot. And so, you know, it's very confusing. I, however, on the other hand, I, I, I really, um, I really like this, I really like the individual percent retained. Because what you can do, it's, you know, it's very basic. I'm a very simple man if you haven't noticed by now. And so if you look here, this is, you can almost think of this, this gradation right here. This is your um, course aggregate. So this is like a stockpile, okay? This is your intermediate stockpile. And this is your fine stockpile. And so whenever you want to combine it together for, let's say, um, concrete, this black line here, that's your combined gradation. So whenever you actually look at it, you'll know, you know, can you even have 3 8 retained on a sieve size? You know, this is as much as anybody has is right here from your course aggregate. It's the same way, and you can also look at your peaks and understand how these different um, individual sieve sizes actually affect your combined gradation. And that's, um, that's kind of a real basic way of understanding. You need to call up the rock quarry and say, hey, um, I'm not using, you know, the correct gradation. I need, I need something bigger, smaller, and you kind of explain to them on the phone what you need. And, um, and, and another thing I should point out, this is out of 100%. So this is the, the exact amount that's, that's retained on that sieve size. So the percent passing sieve size that, that we just looked at, that's the passing amount. This isn't, you know, the, the amount you have retained. So you'll actually have to, to figure out what you have, you'll actually have to do math from each individual, you know, from this, let's, from the 25 to the 19 to figure out from here to here. You'll actually have to, you know, minus it to figure out what's actually retained on that sieve size. This kind of gives you a more nitty gritty detail of what's going on here. And um, it also tells you very clearly, is this well graded, open graded, uniformly graded? You can very really cl you can clearly tell. And so um, this is uh, eight and eighteen is is a very traditional chart that people have used and said um, for for maximum and minimum limits. And other people have used um, have created have changed you know either twenty two and 22 and 5 or, or whatever. And so um, at Oklahoma State, we've done a lot of research at, at actually looking at these gradations. And um, we've, we've came up with what Dr. Lay likes to call the tarantula curve. And it's kind of where we have, for a combined gradation, where we have maximum and minimum limits, and then also um, a total percent retained on certain sieve sizes, so the amount that's on this sieve size and this sieve size and this sieve size are added, you know, are all added together. 
and they have to be within a certain range. And so what some people have done to kind of remedy this problem is they use the uh, percent passing and they'll just say, hey, we want X amount percent passing. Um, you know, we want it between these two control limits. And so, um, you know, that's what a lot of people have used, especially in asphalt. So one thing that people have not really, they don't really understand when they start talking about gradation is they don't always do a um, effects of your sh on your shape. They don't actually say, well, what's your shape of your, of your aggregate for the sieve size? They just don't do it. And so, and like we've talked about before, you can actually go and evaluate this and actually look at it. But, um, you know, everybody thinks you know, nice spherical or cubic shape. But if you really, if you really think about what's going on, I mean, kind of like what I said before, that's not what people imagine whenever they start talking about a gradation and how it's how it's supposed to form or how it's supposed to function for a certain application. You know, they don't think about flatness. They want to think about nice cubic cubical almost rock. I mean, that's kind of what they're that's kind of what they're all about. And so. Um, that's real important just to, to realize. And then this is our last subject, and we'll be done. But this is your maximum sieve size required. So um, this is kind of a, a weird little subject because people talk about maximum sieve sizes and you know nominal maximum sieve size. And um, some different industries, asphalt or concrete, they will actually have a, def a different definition for these. And so since I had a materials professor that was an asphalt guy, I, I like to, um, I think, more towards um, asphalt definitions because I think they make a little more sense. Maybe it's the way he taught it. I don't know. But, uh, but what it is is the maximum size that you can actually use for a certain application. So um, when you say maximum size, what that typically means is the, the smallest sieve size before the aggregate starts becoming retained on it. And then your nominal maximum sieve size is one sieve size larger than the first one to retain 10%. That's kind of a little bit of a mouthful every time I always read that. But if you ever think about the word nominal in general um, for engineering term, very important for engineering terms that always means close to a certain value and so nominals you know we're close to the maximum sieve size and that's what a lot of people have actually um, used in other um, branches other than asphalt and let's see now I think I think we're pretty close to being done except for one little more one thing to show you. So I rambled on a lot about gradation and just because it's the number one specified thing for aggregates. So that's kind of why I went through just briefly understanding gradation in general. Um, but typically what people use is they'll actually um, they came up with this chart here which is, in concrete, it's ASTM C33 gradations. And for other industries, they, um, they've actually adopted this, and they may have one or two different, um, you know, numbers on here. They may, have, they may add something, but they're all the same, you know, percent passing. And so what people typically do is they'll actually say, I want an, uh, a 57 sieve size. So I want to zoom in just a, whoop, just a little bit to kind of explain. You guys see that okay? Okay. And so, so we have like the number 57 sieve size. It's very common for concrete, for asphalt, whatever, to, to use this. And they'll actually, for your... Um, inch and a half they'll have a hundred percent passing you know and they'll go through and you go to the inch and a half they'll have 95 to 100 percent they have a blank you know you can have pretty much whatever you want passing as long as it meets your next requirement here 
So you can actually, you know, when you go through it, and you know, you pretty much zero to, you know, these almost usually don't have anything passing the number four is what most people want because it starts segregating. And so uh, what I'm trying to get at with this chart is if you actually look, say like a 50, 56 stone, you know, it's, it's very similar to the 57, just maybe a little tighter gradation limits. And so if you actually look at the 67 stone, so let's see now, 67, or 57, 67. If you actually look at most of those limits right there, blank 100, you can actually, um, oh, right here. So you can actually almost fit most of these um, be the exact same rock. So you can actually sell a 57 and a 67. It's the same thing. And so um, what I'm trying to say is the, the gradations a lot of times are actually a little too broad. And I kind of wondered why until I found out that whenever they first came up and developed these limits, it was from aggregate producers. So they went all over the United States asking different aggregate producers what they actually produced. And what it came out to be was they just put down the most broad limits you could have that people typically produced naturally that 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 quote unquote worked for their application and that's how they came out with all these numbers which there's nothing wrong with saying well this is what we have to deal with or this is what we have so this is you know the gradation we produce because this is all we can do but um, people have just kind of went and ran with these numbers and that is not um, always a good thing because you never know what your actual um, boundaries are. So, enough off my soapbox. Um, but these, these here, this is actually um, from the Georgia Crushed Stone Association. And these are actually, uh, they came up with this for different nominal aggregate sizes and ASTM 33 gradation um, limits. And you know, it can be anything else. I mean, it's ASTM whatever. Um, you know, gradation is, they're typically um, very similar. But this is the one that most people, this is like the, I mean, almost every concrete, asphalt, um, any type of quarry typically produces some type of 57 stone. This is the big one. And so, but you can also look through what other people have used through different applications and usages and actually look at um, what the ASTM um, standard that they may use for that um, place. So that's about all I have for today. So I think appreciate the people that was here. Say thanks. No, no one's asleep, so that's a good thing. I mean, we talked about aggregates for an hour and twenty minutes. All right. And you can um, just email me on optimizegraded.com if you if uh, cyberspace has any questions.